Hi, my name is Nikolai. I'm from Germany. Um, I'm, I've been doing Drupal since around 2008. I mostly do site building and front end stuff. I can't talk about any fancy back end stuff, so I will talk about fancy front end stuff. Topics are something like this. Um, these are the um, main topics I will talk about a little bit more in depth. And my main topics are these new things that are coming to CSS. And I will spend some time talking about them. And then depending on how much time I've got left, I will talk about some other stuff as well. But I think I've already have too many slides and I don't know if I will um, find the time to talk about everything. It doesn't really matter because at the end you will get a link and it, um, from the link you can get links to any topic I've mentioned within this talk. Also, if I am talking too fast for some slides, doesn't matter. Um, the main part is to give you an idea what's coming to CSS. You don't need to understand any code example I'm giving. Another um, question will be, can I use the stuff I'm presenting right now? And that will depend. In some cases, it's a definite no. You can't use it, not in production. In some cases, it depends. It depends on um, the browsers you need to support. Do you need to support browsers that are one, years old, one year old or maybe two years old or maybe older? Then there's the question, maybe it's just an added feature and it gives, uh, um, it's a nice add-on for people who support, whose browsers support this and it doesn't matter for the older browsers. And in some cases you can ask with add supports if um, the browser supports the new feature or not. Maybe there is a polyfill and maybe there's something like a post CSS plugin. So it depends. Let's start with Baseline. Baseline is a program from WebDev, and um, they are telling you about all the new features that all the new browsers are having, and if you can use them or not. Um, they have a core browser set, and they are testing Chrome, Edge, Firefox, and Safari, and they have two stages. Um, one stage is newly available if a feature becomes supported um, by all of the core browsers um, and you can use it in new projects. And the other is widely available if this feature um, has become available 30 months ago. Uh, which would mean that um, the idea is if it's widely available, you can use it in any project. But maybe you can use it before. They also um, have something like baseline. 2023 and baseline 2024 is the feature becomes available in all browsers in one specific year. It's baseline, um, it's the baseline of the year. And I will use the same, oh, by the way, they are having um, three icons. The first one is limited availability, which means maybe one or two browsers are supporting it. The next one is um, newly available if it's now in every browser but maybe not in browsers that are one or two years old. And the last one is widely available. Three months have passed. And they're using this on their own website. On some articles, you can read baseline newly available. And also, MDN is using it. You can see here the baseline 2023. And Can I Use is using this as well. So it's becoming more common to use the baseline icons for this, and I will use them as well. So let's start with two quick things that most front-end developers will have already heard of. The first one is has. Has is a so-called parent, parent selector. It selects elements containing specific content. And it's actually more than a parent selector because you can take um, siblings into account. Quick example. Um, when we have something like this, these are teasers, and one teaser has an image and the other has not. And you can do this, of course, with two different classes, one for a teaser and one for a teaser with an image. Uh, but in this case, uh, you have to do something to declare which class do I want to use. And you have to use it in Twig and check if there's an image or not. Uh, you can do it in a preprocess function. Um, but you have to do something in Twig. With a new syntax, if you use has, you can just ask if the teaser has an image and then declare your styles depending on that. And you do not need to do anything else in Twig anymore. You can use the same class for both. And as I said, it's more um, than a parent selector because you can take the siblings into account. In this case, you can check 
if the H2 is followed by directly um, by a paragraph and then adjust the margin, for example. Uh, this is now in all browsers. The last one who added it was Firefox last year in December. And there's an old polyfill. I don't know if this is re really usable, but there's also a new PostCSS plugin if someone is using PostCSS. Another thing that most people will have heard of is um, container queries. You can now use container queries based on size. This is also newly al available. And this is what every front-end developer wanted since he ever heard of um, responsive design. And so far, you could use media queries, which are querying the viewport um, of a device. And now you can do the new thing with add container, which is just um, based on the container an element is in. A basic example would be something like this. You have a post, and within the post, you have a card. And now you can do something. You can declare that the post is, um, has a special container type, in this case, container type inline size. And then you can ask the container how, um, um, how wide it is. And depending on the width, you can adjust the font size, for example. And the, this trigger, this is always triggered on based on the nearest ancestor who has something like this, a container context. There's another way to write this. If you want to give um, the parent element a certain name, you can do that and then use a container with that name. This is supported by our browsers. Last one, again, was Firefox who added it last year. There's more than one polyfills for this. And if you heard of these, um, the question is, why do I have the size here in brackets? Because there's another way for container queries. There are also container queries based on style. Um, they are not implemented yet in every browser, so you can't use this in production, definitely not. But it works like something like this. You can ask the container if it has a certain style. And depending on that, then add some styles to other elements within it. Um, in this case, you would ask if a parent is already bold, and then if for some reason there's another B or strong within that element, you um, will do a background yellow. There are other ways to do this. I will not go deeper into this because it isn't working right now in every browser, but you can also do something with um, registers pop properties and then um, do something variable based. This is actually for the moment just in Chromium browsers. So let's start with something uh, I will go more, um, more in depth with, inert. Inert is a way to make an element inactive. That means no clicking is allowed, there will be no focus, you can't select anything, and it's also hidden from the accessibility tree, meaning the screen reader will not know that it's there. How is this useful? Let's first see what it actually does. I have here some simple elements. I can select it, I can click this, I can write something, or I can click this button. If I do the same with the nerd, and this is just an attribute here, nothing works. I can't select anything, I can't click this, I can't write anything here, and this button can't be clicked. But I have no graphical information that this is inert. It just is in this case because it's my example. Let's do something useful with this. And let's say I have a, a slider. This is a very simple slider with four elements that I can scroll through. And the problem here is that all the other elements are still there and I didn't do anything with it. So if I am somebody who uses a keyboard to tap through the content, it will go something like this. Now I'm on the first element and if I tap again, I'm on the second element and then the third. That's not good. So better solution for this is um, all the elements that are not on the screen right now will be um, given the attribute inert. This means I um, for the visible user, nothing changes, but all the things you see, you're not seeing right now, are having an inert. And if I tap now, once I'm in the first element, and when I tap again, the other elements don't count, and I'm on the first button, and then the second button. You um, have no way to reach the other elements which were reachable before. So if you have a teaser like this, and I do have something like this on uh, 
live websites, um, you should add an inert to make this more accessible, meaning to hide the content that is not visible for everybody. Um, but be careful with this. As I said before, you have no graphical information that some element is inert or not. So you, whenever you do something for some reason to make visible content inert, you have to give the user some information about it so that he really knows that he cannot interact with this element. <clears throat> so inert is already um, available. It doesn't work in older browsers, of course, but if you have something like, like that slider, you could still implement it because it makes the world better for modern browsers. Now that you know of inert, you might think, oh, maybe I can do inert with this. This is a simple pop-up. I have here, when I click the button, I get a diff in the middle of the page. The um, um, darker area here is a button. If I click the button, um, I close everything. And the problem here is as well, if I tap through the page, I can still reach the content behind the layer. And I do not want that. If I do not want that, I can use, again, inert. But instead of using inert, there's actually a better solution now. We can use the element uh, dialog. And dialog is an HTML element for a modal or a non-modal dialog box. And the um, difference is with um, a modal, the uh, interaction with the rest of the site is in, um, interrupted. Um, the rest of the page automatically gets rendered inert. And with non-models, you still can interact with the rest of the page. Also, this element gives you some accessibility features for free. I'll give you an example. The main code looks like this. I have a dia dialog HTML element with some content in it. And the dialog is hidden by default. And then I have a button. I will also get, by default, a backdrop. And I can style the backdrop with this um, pseudo element. And in this case, it just gets a groovy background. And the JavaScript is actually pretty easy. The main thing is when I click the button, I will show the model. model. And when I um, click on another button, on this close button, I will close the model. Here, you have two options. You can either open the dialog as a model, in which case the rest of the page gets inert, or you can just show the model, in which case you can still interact with the rest of the page looks something like this. If I click on this button, the dialog is um, showing up, and I can't interact with anything that's behind the layer, and I can't reach it with the tab either. And then, then just close the button. So in comparison, it's pretty easy to do because you just need to show a um, model and a close, and you get the rest for free. So what you get? Dialog is hidden by default. You just need two um, JavaScript functions to open and close um, the element. There's no need to set an autofocus with um, JavaScript within the dialog because you just can use the attribute aut autofocus. The layer behind the dia dialog automatically um, gets added. This is a backdrop element. You don't need to have an extra element. Um, all elements behind the layer are inert if you use show model. You can style the backdrop, and you can use actually escape automatically to get out of the dialog to close it. And um, the dialog can also be closed if you have for some reason uh, a form within the dialog. The behavior is a little bit different depending on if you show it in modal or non-modal form. This is already supported since 2022. So depending on your project, you can use it right now. There's a variation coming up called Popover, which is newly available. It's designed um, to be a popover element. It is similar to dialog, but there are some differences. Uh, the main idea is you have a button. You can trigger something like my popover. And I have a diff here with the same ID, which binds them together. And if I use this, I don't need any JavaScript. It just pops open. I have something else here. If I click next to um, anything here, the popover closes automatically. 
I don't need a close button necessarily. And I don't need JavaScript. This is very new because it's in Firefox just a few months. And there are difference, differences between the two. First, dialog can be used right now, popover not. Dialog needs JavaScript and popover does not. And um, clicking on a popover background closes a popover. That's not the case with the dialog background. But depend, let's say it's two years uh, later and you must decide, will I use the dialog or will I need the popover? In this case, you should uh, check with an accessibility expert because it all depends on how these two elements will actually be featured in a screen reader. Uh, my guess is that one of them will be better usable with a screen reader than the other. So you just have to wait and check which one is better. Now, CSS nesting. This is not very complicated because we already know about nesting from thus or less, and it's like that for the most part. There's one difference I will get to, and it just works like this. You nest your actual elements. You can do it this way, which are used to from, from thus, for example, or you can use a nesting selector, the ampersand. And both of them actually do what you expect. You get something like this if you would write it um, in the traditional way. Now the question is, why would you use the ampersand here? Because this is an old syntax. The old syntax gives you about six months more in some older browsers. So this is supported by all modern browsers, and this some older browsers will need this to um, reflect the nesting. So it might be a good idea for the moment to just use this, this selector. There are some, very, um, some things you can add. You can use it um, in combination with um, other selectors, with the plus sign here, for example. In this case, the ampersand is optional. You can also do something like this, where you use teaser.dark. In this case, it's an element with a class of dark inside an element with a class of teaser. If you write it like this with a selector dot dark, it means the element has to have both um, classes. In this case, the selector must be used, otherwise the browser will not know what you mean. You can also append the selector if you do something like this dot dark ampersand, it will be something like dot dark dot teaser. What you cannot do is something like this, which you might want to do because it's um, good for the BAM um, syntax, but you cannot use this in CSS because of the way CSS works. Um, what you can do is you can put it after something. So if I do this diff ampersand, this becomes diff dot teaser. This is unfortunate, but it's just the way it is. So CSS nesting can be used in modern browsers. So maybe you don't want to use it right now, but maybe in one or two years. years. There's also a post CSS plugin for that. So now we have CSS variables. We are becoming CSS nesting. So do you need thus anymore? Well, that depends how you use thus um, in most um, projects, maybe you will have mixins, and we don't have mixins yet in CSS. What is, is a mixin? If you haven't uh, used this, um, you can build a mixin with a certain uh, word for the mixin, and then use that mixin with an include, and this will just use all the styles you have defined within your mixin. This is from uh, from thus, and there's actually a proposal how to do this in CSS. Uh, it works. Mostly the same, but in this case, we need uh, two hyphens um, for the name. And instead of include, um, the proposal uses apply. This is for the moment just the proposal by um, Miriam Suzanne, but the CSS Working Group has decided to work on this and adopt this as a proposal. So it might be that in a few years, we actually have CSS mix in natively in CSS. And then it depends on what you do, what else you do in, in thus if you really need it anymore. 
Okay, um, the next part is going to be a little bit more complicated. So I don't know how many front-end developers are here. I, will, um, I decided to put in some refreshment um, to refresh some information about the cascade. If you want to find out what a value actually uses as styles when more than one style is defined, um, there are different steps you have to go through. First, you find all the declaration blocks in which this selector, let's say for, an, uh, for a paragraph, um, are there in all your, of your CSS. Then um, it will be decided if some of those styles are important or not. Then the origin is important if um, it comes from an author, a user, or a user agent. We get something new, which is the fourth step, which is called cascade layers, which I will explain in a moment. Then we have specificity. Um, it's the old thing that an ID is more important than a class, it's um, more important than a normal type, and it's more important than no value. Then we're getting something new, a uh, scoping proximity. I will have an example for this as well. And the last thing is the order in which anything is um, declared. And going back to author and user and user origin, it goes like this from the lowest, lowest precedence. We have the normal user ages, agent styles. This is everything a browser gives us, the default values within a browser. Then we have the normal user styles, which is um, when a user overrides some of the browser styles. For example, if the user says, I want to have my base um, font size in 20 pixel. Then we have the normal author styles. This is everything that we write. Then um, there's another layer with styles being animated. And overridden, it, this gets overridden by all the important author styles. Then whenever we use important within our styles, we are overriding our normal styles. But important actually reverses the order. So if a user would use important in his user styles, he overrides everything before. So if a user writes in Firefox his own a declaration and says um, body background pink um, with an important, there's no chance that we can overwrite this with our styles because this important from the user styles is more important. More important than that would be important within the user agent styles if a browser decides to um, uh, implement important. So this all together has relevance for which style actually gets applied to a certain element. Oh, I forgot. Um, there's also styles being transitions as an extra layer. Um, doesn't matter for our part now. Um, an easy example. If you have something like this, a simple paragraph, and you decide to give the paragraph the color green and then the color crimson, of course the paragraph will uh, be crimson because the last, um, the last style wins. This is um, this year, order of appearance, the last wins. If you do something like this, we have a um, paragraph with a class teaser, and you have a paragraph, paragraph.teaser.teaser. Dot dot teaser. In this case, the font size will be um, 3 REM because this has a high specificity. This is this part here. This can get pretty complicated if you have something like this. You have a teaser, you have teaser text, and you have different declarations. In this case, we have an important here. Um, you will probably not get this um, so fast, but the winner will be this one here. The text will be red, and I will get back to this. If you have never seen this before, where and is, it works something like this. If you use it with some selectors, you can group them together, and it saves you some space. So this example will actually translate into main H1, main H2, main H3. This is already supported since 2021. It um, can make your CSS a little bit better readable. So in this case, let's get back to this. In this case, from a specificity standpoint out, um, the paragraph will have a specificity of 001. The teaser text will have um, 0, 1, 0, and this one, the winner is uh, 0 to 1. This here has a higher specificity, but 
I don't use an ID in the example above, so this doesn't count here. The next one is just one class. Where and is usually work the same, but there's one difference. With is, the specificity is the highest within the brackets. So in this case, the is is specificity 0, 1, 0. The where automatically gets a specificity of 0. Other than that, they are working both the same. And the last one has an important in it, but this um, actually styles the parent. This styles this element. And the styles for this element overrides the parent. So in this case, this here wins. So what I wanted to do, um, say with this is can it, this can get really complicated. So how do you solve this? There are different approaches. The main approach is use only classes. You can do it this way. You can do it with BEM. Or you could do, if you really want to, use Tailwind. Everything is done with classes. Let's do a more realistic example. I had something like this in a um, project of mine. Uh, it's a little bit different, but let's say um, I have here a class item and I want to highlight this item for some reason. And the main idea would be just to write a style for list item highlighted. This would work, except when for some reason somebody has already styled something like this. And I had projects like this when I came into this and just wanted to write a thing, simple style with a class and it didn't work because someone decided to um, just chain five or six elements, selectors, one after another. And um, this has a higher specificity and I can't overwrite it with just a class. So this is very annoying. There are different uh, methods to solve this. One would be to change the main code, to change the code for this selector for, to maybe just dot list item, but you don't know if this might break stuff. So maybe you don't want to do this. The other idea would be to use an important, but uh, important is so, shouldn't use that. So maybe you will just use a higher specificity. This will work. But now you have to chain all this together just to override one of those nasty little things here. So now come CSS layers, and they aim to solve this in a different way. You can't use this right now, only in modern browsers, um, but you will, will use this in one or two years. It will be no problem. How do layers work? Oh, no, I'm wrong. They are baseline 2022. So depending on your project, if you say um, my project should work in every browser that is um, two years old or newer, then you can use it right now. Of course, if you still have to support Internet Explorer 11, for some reason you can't use this. Um, it's a new way to organize your CSS to avoid all the specificity problems I talked about earlier. It works something like this. Um, I will use my example here from, the, um, from before with a list item highlighted. And I could do something like this. I add a layer base, and within the base layer, I put the uh, longer specificity example here. And then I add a layer extras. And in this layer extras, I only use the class. Now, if I compare these, this has a higher specificity than this. But now that they are layered, yeah? Question? No, 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 oh, OK. OK, now that they are layered, um, the second layer wins. And the second layer is always, um, always trumps the first layer. So it doesn't matter what specificity we have um, declared here. This will win now. Of course, within the same layer, specificity is still important. But in this case here now, the second wins. Um, in this case, the order is relevant. But you should do it more, mostly in this way, where you actually declare the order of your layers. And in this case, base is a base layer, and extras would, would override everything in base. It's possible to have unnamed layers. I don't know why this is in the, um, in the specification, because um, I think it will just um, add new problems. 
But if you do this, the position of the layer where you, where you declared inside the code will be important. You can also do styles without layers. In this case, the um, unlayered styles will always win against any layered style. So this is within the context of layers, this is something like important because it always wins. Um, in this case, yeah, the P teaser will still be, would still be black because this wins over this declaration. This can get complicated if you do not have a plan. Uh, this is an example taken from MDN. It works like this. This is the first declaration of layout, so this will be the first layer. Then we have a second layer. The second layer has no name. It will be an unnamed layer, but it's still the second one. Then we are having three layers. This will be the third layer. This doesn't count here because it's already declared. This will be the fourth layer. Then we have another part where we add styles for the layer layout. It doesn't change anything because layout was already um, declared here. And then we have as a fifth layer a new unnamed anonymous layer. This, in this combination, it doesn't make any sense because nobody will get through what's actually going on here. It's also possible to have nested layers, because why not? This sounds like it, everything is more complicated, and it is, but it um, makes sense when you um, import components, and within a component, they use nested layers, and you have nested layers in your part, and then you import um, the, um, the nested layers from the component into one layer from you. So it can make sense once you wrap your head around it. Uh, you can also import layers. If you have already written um, for, your, for your project, I don't know, 20 CSS files, you could organize them anew by just importing them into layers. Um, in this case, they, are get, they get imported into a layer. Okay. This is the layer they get imported into. So CSS layers. They are supported since 2022. You can use them right now. My take on this is CSS layers can help you organize um, your styles much better if you have a plan and if you know how to use those layers. On the other hand, if you have many people um, writing your front-end stuff and one of them declares layers and the other doesn't care about layers, this will not help you. So, um, sooner or later, some best practice practices will emerge. So for the moment, maybe keep it simple. If you want to work with layers, maybe use just um, a few. Use a reset, where all your reset information go into. Then use base, maybe for all, all basic stuff. Maybe have one layer just for the grid you're using. Then you can do a layer for components and extras is ev ev anything that you want to override with a new layer extras, which trumps everything. Maybe don't use unnamed layers because in this case, it depends on where you declared them within the CSS um, to define which priority they have. And maybe don't lose, use unlayered styles because they went over everything else. But once you read you, you wrap your head around it, it can solve some of your specificity problems. Okay, another thing that's coming is CSS scope. And it does what you expect from something called scope. It limits the reach of your selectors. Works like something like this. You can scope a card and then use image, and this image styles will only apply to anything that's within a dot card. That's nice. Another way to do this is if you have a card, you could um, do some inline style declarations there and use scale, um, scope there. Has the same effect. But, uh, sorry, how is it different from nested? Oh, in this example, not because we already know how to do that. It's the same as uh, we're doing this here. Uh, and, and what's the difference between scope and has in this? Uh... 
In this example, you can do this with this um, different, uh, has is, is different because has uh, does the styles for the parent. If you use um, has image, it will style the card, and this here styles the image. But you can use different um, stuff. I just use this because it's an easy example to show scope. It will get more complicated, and then it maybe get clear why you need scope. This is just for the syntax. Um, so we can do the same with, uh, with this dot card um, image, but there's a subtle difference uh, because in this case, um, this here has a specificity of uh, 0, 1, 1, 1 for the class and 1 for the normal element. This here just has a specific specificity of 0, 0, 1. This might be important. Um, you can um, use a scope element within your scope. The scope element actually defines the styles for the parent. In this case, the scope is the card. You could define your styles for the card here. Now, there are different ways to write this. If you want to address the image, you can just use image. You could use um, scope image, or you could use the nesting opera, um, selector and use ampersand image. This is all the same for the styling purposes. It's still a little bit different because the specificity is a little bit different, which might be important depending on how you write this. Um, but the ampersand and the scope are not the same because in this um, case, if you use ampersand, ampersand, it will actually be something like, um, this should be in D, a card within a card. But you cannot use scope, scope, because it would be the root item inside the root at item, and this um, doesn't make any sense. This would not work. <coughs> now, the interesting thing about scope is you can put an endpoint to your scope. In this case here, you say the scope root begins where you want to begin with your styles, and yet then you can say to scope limit where you want to end your styles. An example. You could say, I want to scope the images within my feature, but only up to the point where I begin a slider, because the slider has different styles. You could use this with this syntax, and then it only um, triggers for the images that are within a feature, but not within a slider within a feature. And this is um, what some people call the donut, because it just um, takes certain parts of your page and um, it, um, styles this part, but not the, the other part you explicitly want to take out of it. This can get complicated depending on how you write this, but there are some options to make this more complicated. Um, I'm not going further into this because it's complicated enough. Of course, this can be nested, because why not? So the first thing I thought uh, what maybe, uh, um, where, where this could maybe be used was for a website documentation. Let's say I have a manual page here, and I have some text and some text. And here I have a component from the website. And in this case, the component is um, just an image. You can't do anything with it. This will work because it's just an image. Maybe you could do something like this and use a component from the website and scope this component. This works in one direction. All the styles you define here do not bleed into the rest of the website. So the manual will not get um, anything from the um, styles you defined here. But it doesn't work the other way around, because this element still gets all the things it inherits from the manual. So for example, colors or uh, font declarations will all bleed into this component. And this is not what you want. You could do something like this, where you scope these styles to manual up to the point where you come to the component, and then have this scoped just for the component. This would work. A better example is something like this, color-themed components. This is the best example I've seen for scoping. So maybe you have some text within uh, theme light, and maybe you have some text within theme dark. This is not 
very difficult to just write some CSS for this and have uh, a background color and a color for the text. Um, this will work unless you have the option to nest your themed components. In this case, this will not work anymore. Um, this here, I still have text, but the text has the wrong color. And this is because in this case, this text is within theme light and it is within theme dark. This text is also within theme dark and within theme light. So they get both of these styles apply and the last one wins. So all of these piece get um, this color. That's not good. But with scoping, this suddenly works. If you do something like this, we scope uh, the theme light and we scope the theme dark, and we give the, the scope the background color and the P is the normal color, this suddenly works because of the new rule of scoping proximity. This means that this is in two scoping contexts, inside the scoping of theme light, light and inside the scoping of theme dark. But the theme light here is the nearest scoping ancestor, so this overrides the other scoping. This is the same here, so this works with these declarations for both cases, and you can nest them whatever, um, however you want. This only works as long as these declarations have the same specificity. Because if you do something like, um, <coughs> okay, scoping proximity overrules source order, but it is self overridden by other higher priority criteria, such as importance, layers, and specificity. Example, if I would do something like this, I've just added a scope here in front of the P. This changes the specificity of this element, and now this and this, they don't have the same specificity anymore, so this always overrides the second one. And if you do it like this, it doesn't work anymore. You will get something like this. So, CSS scopes. At, um, at the moment, limited availability, but it will come. Um, you can maybe um, think of it like this. At the moment, it's, it looks complicated, and use cases may be um, difficult to find. But let's think about you are using BEM right now, and maybe if you use scope, you don't, need, you don't need all your classes. You maybe only need the class for, I don't know, a card or a teaser, and the rest is scoped, and you just are fine with one class you're given. This could um, help you solve a lot of, or save a lot of classes within your theme in the long run. Uh, just as a reminder, this is uh, the new part where cascade layers come in, and this is the new part where the scoping proximity comes in. And this was the last example I've shown. The scoping proximity overrides order of appearance, but is still beaten by specificity. And you need to know that if you want to work with layers or scope, because uh, you need to know what overrides what. OK, that was a hard part. Oh, I don't have much time anymore. <laughs> okay, I expected this. Let's do um, maybe this one as a last thing. It's easy. Um, you, we have uh, logical properties now. Um, you may know this from a box model. This is the old, these are the old properties like a margin top, border top, padding top. And we are having for some time now other properties which look like this margin block start, margin block, uh, border block start, padding block start, and here margin inline start border inline start. Um, these orders in the, on the right side depend on the reading order of the text and on the writing order. It depends on the language you're working in. Example, let's say we have this website with the German text and uh, text in Hebrew, and this is a block quote, and the block quote has a red line on one side or the other side, depending on the reading order. And this is a real example from uh, the Jewish, Mu Jewish Museum in Berlin. And um, it's done with a block quote, and the block quote in Hebrew has a language attribute for Hebrew. And when I wrote the code in 2020, I just used this. I gave the block quote a padding and a border. And then for Hebrew, I had to reset these two and gave them a padding and a border on the other side. 
This, of course, works. There's another way to write it if you want to. You could write it like this. But in this case, you need to know all the languages that might be used on the website. With the new logical properties, it's easier to write this because you could just use this. You use padding inline start and border inline start, and it will work in both languages because the reading order dictates on which side the inline start is. So this is actually for some multilingual pages uh, better because it saves you some CSS. Also, other properties are using inline and block uh, more often. Inline is um, in the horizontal order and block is in the vertical um, lane. And you will see this with other CSS features and other stuff you can write. There are some um, values you can use block and inline in. Uh, this is already wide, widely available, and it might be a good idea to adopt this now because it's more flexible. And scroll-driven animations actually use this uh, block and inline syntax at one point, but since I've talked so, uh, talked so long about the other stuff, I don't know if you want to hear any more. Yeah? Okay, okay. I, I try to be... Um, Quick. Uh, you can now uh, animate uh, stuff based on the position on your scroll bar. Is this new? It's just limited. Uh, we can already do um, animations. It's not, it's not that hard. This is a beating heart. This is done um, traditionally with just an animation based on the time. I have an animation here, heartbeat. It goes for one second. It's infinite. It's linear. And then I have my keyframes, which define the heartbeat. So instead of... Um, doing this with a, a time frame. I'm doing this now with a scroll bar. There's actually a, a simple way to do this with scroll. And with scroll, you can do either, as it was, you can do it without values or you can do it with values. And here, the block and inline values, which I just mentioned, are available. And again, this depends on the reading order and the writing mode. So in Chinese, um, block and inline work different than in English. So um, the Variation with scroll didn't work for some reason in this browser, so I did a slight variation of this. We need a container. We need something that scrolls so that I have a scroll bar. And then I can say scroll timeline hard scroll. And then I say with for my heart, I use the animation timeline. So now they are bound together, and the keyframes are just like before. And now I get this. I can scroll this and animate my heartbeat. And it's um, bound to the position of the scroll bar. Uh, if I use this in a, in a text, this will work as well. But my positioning, um, I use this, it, it will be triggered at around 50%. And you can see it here. But if uh, the heart would be at a, another position, maybe the animation is somewhere where you can't see it because the text isn't there. So instead of binding this to just the scroll bar, it would be nice to start the animation when maybe it comes into sci a view, and maybe when it leaves um, the view, you stop with the animation. And of course, I thought about this, and it's um, within the specification. You can actually do a view progress timeline, in which case you just add a view timeline for this. And if you do this, you can actually achieve this, that the heart actually starts the animation when it comes into view, and it ends the animation when it um, ends the, the view. This is, um, there are some better um, examples. Maybe I'll, I'll show them as the last part. I don't have internet. Go to this um, site. They have better animations. Um, you can use this right now because depending on how you use this, uh, if I use the animation I've shown in Firefox, Firefox can't do the animation, but Firefox would still show a heart. It's just a static heart, but uh, you don't you, um, lose anything. The animation would work in the Chromium uh, browsers. You could only also do this. You could check if your CSS, if the browser supports actually scroll, and you should check if the user maybe wants to um, prefers reduced motions, in which case you wouldn't show the animation. So if you add all of this together, you can do some fancy stuff in the Chromium browsers with added animations with the scroll bar. 
and all the other browsers that don't understand this will just not show the animation. OK, let's stop here. First of all, thank you. Pure joy. Um, I'm a backend guy, but uh, it's really great to see these advances in the front end area. It's really cool. Uh, so for me, I'm not that uh, strong in uh, defining the priorities of different CSS paths, right? And we used to have like this imp um, important thing that overrides uh, all the other specifications. Now it only has. Uh, two positions, either it has an important and or either it's not. So uh, are there any plans to have it maybe with a weight-like style, so that important with weight 10, important no. with weight, no. Okay. No, no, um, the rule is uh, don't use important. Yeah. You should uh, organize your CSS in a way that you don't need important. And the new um, stuff I showed with the layers and the scope is meant to give you more options to get rid of important. Just use all the other stuff. For the moment, use layers. You can organize your stuff better. You do not need important. Yeah. Yeah, my fault. Yeah. So in Drupal, we might have like CSS coming from another uh, uh, part. So in your example, how would you solve this? Um, you can import this maybe and use use import and put them in a layer, and then they are uh, they are in a layer, and um, you don't they are not um, unlayered anymore, and that might help you with your problem. Let me find the slide. Yeah, you can do something like this here. If you have a CSS and they are unlayered, just import them and then they are layered because you give them a layer. Okay. So my guess is every back-end developer is now happy that I have front-end developers who have to deal with this stuff. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I forgot. Um, actually, if you want to have um, with this stuff, this is the link. This is the link. I have a link list there. And if you, for some reason, want to have the slides, they are also there. The slides only work for desktop, but I think most people are um, fine with the link list.